Hello, and welcome to the Journal of Democracy podcast. I'm Brent Kalmer, managing editor of the journal. And I'm joined today by Jurgen Moller and Sven Erik Skanning, who are authors of The Third Wave Inside the Numbers from the October 2013 issue of the Journal of Democracy. And I should note that this appears as a free download at journalofdemocracy.org. So the piece that we'll be speaking about today, you can also read on your own. Now, a brief word about uh, our authors today. Jurgen Moller and Sven Erik Skanning are associate professors of political science at Aarhus University in Denmark. And their most recent book is Democracy and Democratization in Comparative Perspective. They also had a, an essay called Regime Types and Democratic Sequencing, which appeared in the January 2013 issue of the Journal of Democracy, of which this new piece is a bit of a continuation, you might say. So first off, uh, welcome for, or thank you for joining us, you two. Well, uh, it's our pleasure. And let's, let's start right in here with, with the uh, substance of your piece. And I'm just going to read you a brief quote, and then uh, maybe you can kind of expand upon it. In the piece, you write that, quote, according to Freedom House's annual Freedom in the World survey, the last seven years, which are 2006, 2006 to 2012, were notable for democratic setbacks rather than democratic gains. This seven-year slump has breathed new life into two closely intertwined debates about the, quote, third wave of democratization. So perhaps you could uh, describe these two debates and expand a bit on them. Certainly. Um, uh, so, so just to recap the notion of a third wave of uh, democratization, the, the idea is that since its uh, second advent after 1800, uh, democracy has uh, spread in three uh, waves. Uh, and uh, the most recent of these uh, is one that Samuel P. Huntington, uh, in a famous book from 1991, uh, dated to the early 1970s. Um, so this is the so-called third wave of democratization, uh, which we uh, disaggregate in our article, uh, basically in two ways. Uh, uh, we do it by uh, showing uh, development across different regime types, which is something I think we'll come back to. Uh, and then we do it uh, by going down to the regional level to show how uh, developments in different regions uh, differ from each other, the differences and similarities between uh, regions. Uh, but, but, but the point about that quote is that the recent setback that has been registered since uh, uh, about 2006, uh, uh, so, so the, the, the fact that uh, there has been some democratic setbacks in, in the most recent years, it has uh, reinvigorated two uh, debates uh, uh, about this uh, third wave. And the first uh, debate is whether a reverse wave is looming uh, or threatening. Uh, uh, this was something that, that Huntington actually also touched up on in his 1991 book where he basically uh, 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 prophesied that, that such a, a reverse wave uh, was uh, beckoning. Uh, but in, in the mid-1990s, a number of other researchers touched up on this idea uh, uh, and uh, uh, argued that, that this was a likely scenario. Uh, then that debate uh, was somewhat ignored for for a couple of years, but this new uh, setback has then rekindled it. Uh, and uh, the arguments that have been made here is that, uh, uh, that a number of factors uh, uh, are presently conducive to such a uh, setback or rollback, uh, uh, namely factors such as the financial crisis, uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the uh, uh, flourishing of China, uh, and also a kind of general dissatisfaction with regime performance uh, in new democracies. Uh, so that's the first of the two debates. The second one then concerns the spread of a gray zone uh, between democracy and autocracy. Uh, and here the point uh, that uh, scholars have raised is that um, political openings uh, during the third wave and especially after the breakdown of communism have tended to produce not uh, genuine democracies but more uh, hybrid regimes, uh, so uh, regimes that, that are characterized by some mix of uh, autocratic and democratic features. Uh, and uh, most importantly, scholars have argued that these uh, hybrid regimes are gray zone regimes uh, and not just stopovers on the uh, uh, path to, uh, for instance, liberal democracy, uh, but are, are stable regimes which are likely to endure. Uh, 
so regimes such as liberal democracy, for instance, as Farid Zakaria spoke about, uh, is something uh, that's likely to become a mainstay uh, of, uh, uh, of of this uh, these third wave development. And this is something that you approach uh, by using a typology, really, that you introduced in the January 2013 issue. You kind of classify democracies in different ways with increasingly demanding definitions of democracy. And I'll just uh, I'll just briefly mention these four types, and then perhaps you could uh, explain them a bit more. So the four types you identify, and these are four types of democracy, are minimalist democracy, electoral democracy, polyarchy, and liberal democracy. So perhaps you could just uh, give us a brief synopsis of what distinguishes these. Sure. <clears throat> With regard to minimalist uh, democracy, uh, this regime type only requires that political competition for political leadership takes place via regular elections with uncertain outcomes. So basically, uh, these regimes have to fulfill three criteria. Elections must be contested, uh, the winners take office and rule, and the elections have to be repeated uh, once in, in a while. Uh, and it's really important for us to emphasize that minimalist democracies are different from what we call uh, electoral autocracies. Uh, first and foremost, uh, with regard to whether the uh, opposition uh, is able to win victories or not in principle. Uh, but moving on to the next step in our hier hierarchical order of uh, democratic regime types, we have the electoral democracy, which requires higher levels of electoral integrity. Uh, this means there will be no room for irregularities, such as uh, problems with the uh, voter registration and, and other stuff. Uh, the regime type polyarchy then adds uh, to these features uh, full respect for freedom of speech and freedom of association, the classical liberal uh, liber political liberties. Then on the top of our hierarchy, we have the most uh, demanding uh, definition of democracy, which uh, we include, which uh, is uh, also adding equality before and under the law as a criterion. And this is an interesting way of going about addressing these kind of two intertwined debates that we spoke of before, because now you're talking about kind of imposing this hierarchy on the developments that we've seen in, in the third wave or since the third wave began. And one of the things that you mentioned that's quite interesting is that there are some interesting trends such as the deepening of democracy in many regimes from the 1990s onward in particular. Which countries have become deeper democracies throughout that time? Yeah, I think what is critical for us to emphasize with our typology is that instead of saying that there's one correct definition, we want to use the different understandings to get a more nuanced picture of the political regime developments. And this, uh, these distinctions enable us actually to point out the countries that have uh, experienced uh, more democratic uh, deepening than just entering the set of uh, uh, democracies. So what we find is that in uh, no less than three out of five regions, we have seen uh, a quite substantial deepening of democracy. This has mostly taken place in Latin America, Eastern Europe, and, and in, in Asia, but not really uh, in the Sub-Saharan Africa and in the MENA uh, region. In uh, Latin America, we have seen uh, countries like uh, Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay and Brazil moving from uh, uh, being uh, among the uh, autocratic countries to actually uh, become quite uh, deep democracies, that is, uh, polyarchies or liberal democracies. In Asia, we have seen the same experience uh, in countries such as South, uh, South Korea and Taiwan and many of the Pacific uh, islands. And among the former communist uh, countries in Eastern Europe, the deepening of democracy has first and foremost taken place in the new uh, EU membership uh, countries. Actually, in this region, the de geographic distribution of the regime types is, uh, is very striking, uh, where we see uh, the easternmost parts, uh, easternmost uh, parts of, of this region, we have uh, still see uh, autocracies. In the westernmost parts, uh, westernmost parts we see uh, uh, quite deep democracies in the form of uh, polyarchies and liberal democracies. And in the middle, we see a, lo a lot of uh, gray zone uh, regimes. And this is a point that you make, uh, especially in the piece, is the, the need to distinguish between kind of the global trends that you're looking at and, and then drill down to the regional trends, which you just spoke about. What is the importance of making that distinction? I think the importance here is uh, that we see that the dynamics are different in different regions. 
So whereas we in the Eastern Europe and in Sub-Saharan Africa see very abrupt uh, changes uh, uh, from uh, situations with uh, characterized by only having autocracies in the region to getting a more uh, different, uh, very many kinds of regime types, uh, we see a more gradual development going on in the Southeast Asia and in Latin America. Of course, if I can, can just add to that, uh, uh, the very notion about these two debates uh, and the fact that a reverse wave might be threatening uh, or that uh, there might, uh, to a larger or smaller extent, be a gray zone uh, is something that's quite interesting to uh, uh, to investigate on the regional level uh, because, of course, the, the case might be that uh, democracy is more under pressure in some regions than in others or is flourishing more in some regions than in others. Uh, and uh, likewise, the case might be that these gray zone regimes, uh, so uh, in our typology uh, instances uh, uh, of uh, minimalist democracy and multi-party autocracy, is more common in some regions than in others. Uh, and this is, of course, something we can only uh, appraise if we look, or as you say, drill down to the regional level. Mm -hmm. And this also seems to have some interesting implications for what is known as the debate on democratic sequencing. In the earlier article, in Regime Types and Democratic Sequencing, you say that, quote, the debate has focused on the sequencing of state building, liberal constitutionalism, and mass participation in elections. The most common point of departure is the observation that the original sequence leading to, to democracy in Western Europe and its settler colonies, which are Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States, was one in which state building and the rise of liberal constitutionalism preceded large-scale electoral democratization. Now, could that, that same sequence be followed today? Yeah. Uh, so uh, this uh, sequencing debate, it has basically been fought out over two issues. Uh, the first uh, descriptive question is, uh, which attributes have tended to come first in democratization processes? And the second question that has been posed is then, uh, which attributes should come first to facilitate uh, democratic uh, deepening most? Uh, so uh, where the first question is basically descriptive, the second one is, is prescriptive or normative. Uh, here the important point uh, to make is that, uh, uh, that while there is a lot of agreement that the Western um, uh, development uh, was one where state building and uh, constitutionalism preceded democracy, we can also very quickly make the point that this Western development was based on a very unique combination of uh, explanatory conditions. Uh, which are uh, unlikely to have uh, been present elsewhere. Um, uh, and for this reason, uh, when other countries have uh, uh, embarked on these political openings uh, during the third wave, they've done so from a vastly different point of departure. Uh, so uh, one where they do not have a long-lasting legacy of constitutionalism uh, uh, and uh, representative institutions. Uh, so, so that's the first observation we can make that uh, the, the Western pathway differs in that it is based on some very uh, idiosyncratic uh, premises. Uh, secondly, we can observe that, uh, especially in the decades uh, uh, following the breakdown of communism, uh, democracy has really triumphed uh, in an ideological sense. Uh, so uh, they have developed what has been termed a democratic zeitgeist, or uh, the notion that uh, democratic rule is really the only legitimate uh, form of rule. Uh, and in this context, uh, so if you combine these two observations, uh, uh, then we make the argument in our article that uh, uh, today uh, it's almost inconceivable uh, uh, that uh, one could have another sequence than the one uh, which starts with competitive elections. Uh, uh, people are simply not uh, willing to wait uh, for democracy uh, uh, is one argument. And another one is that uh, autocrats who are not held accountable uh, really have very poor incentives to uh, uh, create uh, such things as the rule of law or effective uh, state institutions. Um, uh, and, and one reflection of this is, uh, and this is something we show uh, in the first of our two pieces, uh, is that what has been termed the autocratic pathway to liberal democracy, uh, so, so the pathway which privileges the rule of law uh, over electoral rights, uh, is virtually not present uh, today. Uh, uh, 
Uh, that is, uh, it has virtually not been present uh, uh, during the third wave, uh, which we uh, investigate. Well, on that note, we should thank you for joining us. Uh, my guests today have been Jürgen Moller and Sven Erik Skanning of Aarhus University in Denmark. They are authors of The Third Wave Inside the Numbers, which appears in the October 2013 issue of the Journal of Democracy. And this appears as a free download on our site. You can go and uh, read exactly what uh, professors Moller and Scanning have to say on, on the matter. And uh, we appreciate you joining us, professors. Thank you very much. Our pleasure.